thank you very much for your invitation today to speak at this uh, um, this uh, conference, uh, the 14th International Conference of the World Association for Sustainable Development. So, yes, yeah, so I want to say a bit um, about UEL's response to the Syrian refugee crisis in particular, um, but I also want to explain how um, that fits very well with UEL's mission, uh, its uh, underlying philosophy uh, in terms of its place as an institution of higher education and the type of institution that it is, and also how that feeds in to what we expect of our students uh, as citizens of the world, and also indeed how it informs our approach to the curriculum uh, and learning and teaching. So. Um, we have launched, just within the last couple of years, our new corporate plan um, to be London's leading university uh, for civic engagement. And I have to say that many, many corporate plans sit gathering dust uh, in, in, in drawers and desks. Uh, this one hasn't, uh, and I've been amazed by the response that I've had uh, from this corporate plan from staff and students alike. And I still get two or three emails every week from staff and students about civic engagement. Why? Because civic engagement, as we understand it, as an anchor institution uh, in our part of London, has always been part of our DNA uh, as an institution. So what does that mean? Um, it means that we, in terms of our core values, are committed to social mobility, social justice, and in particular, and in relation to the theme of this conference, social innovation, which means working with our communities to deliver applied and sustainable solutions to the societal and environmental challenges that we face. And I think that resonates quite nicely with what you're trying to do, both as a conference uh, and as an organization. So let me say a bit more about that. First of all, it's important in relation to the Syrian refugee crisis in particular um, to understand that the University of East London, just as it's had that sort of DNA which has been around social mobility and social inclusion, has also got a long-standing academic engagement um, with the whole question of migration. So our Centre for Refugees, Migration and Belonging was the first centre in the UK um, set up over 20 years ago to look at these issues, way in advance of the Compass Centre at the University of Oxford. We were running MAs in uh, migration studies uh, 20, 30 years ago. Um, we have a raft of international development programmes, uh, international development and NGO organisations. Many of our students have gone on and form charities that are directly involved in international development. Perhaps the best known of them, Child Reach International, uh, has a turnover of six million pounds now, works extensively in uh, South America and West Africa, and also in Nepal uh, after the earthquake uh, crisis, rebuilding the educational sector there. And that charity, Child Reach International, six million pound turnover, started off uh, with two or three of our students on a program in international development in 2007. We gave them some uh, seed corn funding and they set themselves up as a charity in our incubation centre uh, in East London and have grown now so that our students who study international development now go on placement with that charity, Child Reach International. So that's what we do as a university and we are also academically home for the Refugee Council archives. And I said I'd say a bit about the underlying philosophy, um, this approach um, to civic engagement and how it touches on um, our mission as an institution. And really the underlying um, philosophy um, comes from the UN's Human Development Index uh, and really focuses on taking a capability approach to human development. So many of you will be familiar, I guess, with UN's Human Development Index and the work of Amartya Sen and also the philosopher Martha Nussbaum. And it's really about a development measure and this is how we measure our impact as an institution in our community 
uh, it's a measure of creating capability uh, in health, education and well-being as an institution for our community and for our students within our community. And I think that's a different measure of wealth. Um, the UN measures this measure of wealth not by a country's GB, GDP, but how healthy um, and how well educated uh, its uh, population is. So it's a different sort of impact measure. And we I embrace that as a university. Um, we're a charity as well. Uh, yes, we're a business and we're there to stay in business, but we're driven by uh, this underlying philosophy. And the capability approach also then is what we expect of our students. And there are, in that respect, three important A's to focus on. Agency. Through civic engagement and the projects that our students get involved in, we expect them to become agents of social change and then become agents in their own community as leaders of social change within their community. Agency. Very important. We expect during their time at UEL that they become actualized. And what that means is that we tap into their latent potential and actualize them as individuals, as agents. And thirdly, affiliation. And for me, perhaps this is the most important measure of all. And as Martha Nussbaum says, higher education contributes to creating capabilities precisely in terms of developing affiliation. And affiliation means being able to live with and towards others and show concern for other human beings. So agency, actualization, and affiliation, that sense of the recognition of the importance of the other, is what we want to instill in all of our students. So that's where the importance of developing civic engagement comes into it. And that's how students play an active role in developing their communities. And I'll just highlight, before I talk about the particular project that we've had around the Syrian refugee crisis, which is an interesting case study in itself, I'll just highlight the fact that every year now, we have groups of students and staff engaged in projects which are London Scholar projects. So we have the London Scholars. And what we focus on are particular challenges, both in London and internationally, um, that we face in terms of sustainable development, amongst other things. So many of these projects um, actually are underpinned by the research interests of staff, but then students also become part of that sort of research community. And these are projects that run for about 12 weeks, um, and we support them uh, through some central funding. And we've literally, in the first two years of embedding civic engagement, now had about 50 of these projects. And I've just highlighted some here. So for instance, there's equality and diversity projects like training as an interpreter and a cultural broker. Those students and staff have now set up a portal um, for cultural translation within the community. Um, here's another one, the creation of a living wage zone in Newham. Many of the employers, the big employers in Newham, don't pay, don't pay the living wage. Many of our students and staff are already working on financial literacy projects. So for instance, part of civic engagement is our Money Mentors project, where working with London citizens, staff and students go out to local schools and colleges and advise school children and college students about the dangers of payday loans, about the importance of financial literacy, and indeed, as a university, we were the first university in the UK to come out actively um, stopping advertising of payday loans on our campuses. And that's also a lead that was followed by many other universities. So all of these projects are tackling, many of them public health projects, uh, assessing the access and acceptability of a mobile app used for mental health disorders within the community. They're all based within the community. They're all taking up a challenge that our community faces. And staff and students often at the end of it produce a report. And often many of these projects have high level patrons um, who oversee the project as well and help broker and network links uh, into community based organizations. So the London Scholars actually is the realization of civic engagement, but it also impacts on how we deliver our learning and teaching. 
And here's another example of a London Scholars Project that this time is international. So again, this is staff and students um, who very quickly um, went across um, when the whole Syrian crisis, the refugee crisis, really began uh, to gain profile. And I guess, you know, there was a whole momentum behind people's response to it. And our staff and students actually delivered uh, something they called University for All. So they went voluntarily over to Calais um, and offered an accredited short course program with the people of Calais in, in the camps there, uh, with the refugees, on life stories. And they engaged students from a range of countries, Sudan, Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran, Syria, Ethiopia. This was supported by UEL's Civic Engagement Fund. But importantly, these staff and students actually took an interdisciplinary approach. So we combined art, poetry, film, photography, creative writing. And the idea was to get the refugees themselves um, to tell their story. Um, and of course, that was partly a travel narrative, but it was also uh, a biographical narrative. It was a story about their uh, life, about their uh, current displacement and how they came to be where they are now. And that's an accredited program. It, it produced a, a group of students um, who came through uh, the program. I've got the external examiner's report there saying how impressed she was uh, by the work that was produced uh, on this program. So we were the only university in the UK, I, I think, offering this uh, to a group of refugees in Calais last year, and we're going to continue with this program next year as well. The important thing about that is, I guess, that what it means for our, stu for our students in particular is it gives them a fantastic experience of something as a lived experience. So rather than just understanding issues to do with uh, migration uh, and displacement, uh, theoretically, they're actually engaging with people who've suffered these life-changing experiences. So, Part of our response as a university, though, has been uh, to do something which we hope is even more material in terms of its potential impact. So at the time, this time last year, really, when the full impact of what happened in Syria became apparent, um, staff actually, uh, over a weekend in particular, and you perhaps remember that weekend, when uh, the whole sort of response certainly in this country, to what was happening, seemed to undergo something of a transformation. And there was a massive mobilization, both of public opinion, but also in practical terms of people wanting to do something um, to help. And my staff over that particular weekend got in contact with me and said, look, shouldn't we offer some way for some of the displaced uh, refugees to, to come into the UK and take up the opportunity of higher education? And so we looked at it and we said, yep, yeah, okay, we'll offer 10 um, postgraduate scholarships for students because we, we thought that would be the easiest way uh, for students who probably al already had some prior qualification to come into the UK uh, and take up maybe some master's programs. Um, we were the first university to do that. Um, and what happened very quickly uh, after that um, was that many other uh, universities followed us. And currently, there are over 30 different universities offering something like a cumulative sum of 2.5 million uh, in terms of bursaries, uh, different sorts of schemes all coming together um, under an umbrella group, which is now hosted by the Citizens UK group. And actually, one of the things the staff came to me and asked me um, and said, you know, we're proud to be all about civic engagement. Can you, as our vice chancellor, actually sit on the Nas National Refugee Welcome Board as the representative uh, for UKHE. So I did that and I was very pleased and honoured and humbled to do it. And uh, the group, the National Refugee Welcome uh, Board, I is a fantastic example of various uh, voluntary and civic institutions and organisations working together in a collaborative way um, to, to work to help the resettlement um, programme that's going on at the moment. What's impressive about it, I guess, is that every time I go to one of these meetings, and there are about three or four a year, is the organization 
uh, the way in which people are all in it um, in, in terms of affiliation that I talked about, in terms of what can we do uh, for the other. Um, so there are groups like Citizens UK, there's groups like the Salvation Army, there's various other groups, you know, church groups of all faiths and de denominations are, are involved in this. So it's been a fantastic um, sort of example, really. And what's happened as a result of that is that the broader issues of refugees and asylum seekers, uh, of course, manifest themselves as very complex. Um, that, for instance, many of the displaced, and you'll know this very well, that many of the displaced Syrians aren't actually even going to be within the 20,000 that eventually come to the UK. They'll be in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Egypt and elsewhere, equally wanting to take up um, uh, the opportunity of higher education. And we're working now uh, as the National Refugee Welcome Board and, and HE quite closely with the British Council, for example, because as it's evolved, this whole sort of, um, this whole situation, I think, um, has different aspects to it. One of the aspects is the need for in-country delivery. So really, in a way, the Calais example is a good example of the way in which universities uh, across Europe can maybe come together uh, in a hub-type situation and offer a university-for-all type program in places like Egypt and uh, Jordan and Lebanon so that everybody there, the refugees there, can uh, actually take up uh, the opportunity. And as the British Council are, are saying, you know, this isn't just about Syrians who, who come to the UK, it's about maybe Syrians and other refugees who come to the UK who are then able to go back and help in the uh, reconstruction or the development that's needed after the crisis. So it's very much a, a two-way street here. Uh, and I think the complexity of that is not always understood because it tends to just be reduced uh, and caricatured as the issue of immigration. But actually, this is very much about us working in an integrated way within the rest of Europe and beyond um, to actually provide uh, higher education and training and development for people who can then go back and help in what's required in terms of the uh, development that will be needed in terms of the reconstruction that happens after the crisis. So I think that's been really interesting. As a result, also, what we found is we've worked very closely with Her Majesty Government and the Home Office, and you'll have seen yesterday that the Home Office published in the UK um, the opportunity for community sponsorship of refugees, and that's been very much at the background. I'm not saying that we made that happen, but I have to say the Home Office have been very supportive in trying to find other ways of supporting refugees to come uh, into the UK in that respect. Because one of the problems we've had is that the, there is a disconnect between demand and supply. So we've got over 30 universities offering this supply of education. Um, but it's very difficult to match people uh, to those places. Why? Because as, say, part of a 20,000, many of them will get resettled into places far flung and far and wide. Indeed, many of the first migrants who came across were resettled in Butte in Scotland, not particularly near any university. So, you know, we're trying to work in a way that preserves confidentiality and the UN uh, Human Rights Commission are involved in this work as well and the Home Office and everybody else to try and ensure that we match the demand with the supply. And that for me, you know, I didn't expect to get into the complexity of all of these types of issues, but that's been the most salutary thing for me. That just saying that you can help is one thing, but actually the practicality of doing so is always made more complicated um, in ways that we're all familiar with. So that coordination of matching supply and demand has been a big challenge, I think, but I'd be happy to pick up any questions you've got about that. But it's been a huge opportunity, and I think the development yesterday is a welcome one, and I hope we see more of that uh, in the future. So, as I say, um, there's been a productive dialogue, there's an evolving role of the National Refugee Welcome Board, um, and more of an alliance of uh, higher education um, and various groups within higher education coming together um, to respond um, to the refugee crisis. But I think, for me, um, it's that UEL was already in the right place at the right time. 
we were already committed, you know, from 2014 to this new corporate plan, but actually that was just something UEL has done for years and years and years. It went with the grain with, of the institution. It's part of what we see our role as, as an anchor institution in East London, uh, and our impact as an institution, remember going back to the capabilities approach, isn't about GDP, it's not about you know financial surplus, it's as much about you know, what can you do to ensure the future health, well-being and education and qualitative impact on your community and on your international community. And I see that very much about our role as a university and I think when universities work best it's when they do have that sort of really palpable and sustainable uh, impact. Thank you.